Welcome. This is APIs for automating network element deployment. So before we begin, I'd like to ask you guys um, what your role, are, role is. So who's a network engineer or admin? Mostly. Uh, any developers? Anyone something else I did not get? No? No one? OK. <laughs> So anyone have any reason why they are here that they're willing to share? For those of you in the front row, this is the mandatory audi audience participation row. <laughs> Just warning you. <laughs> anyone? What was that? Automating? So yes, we're going to discuss how you can automate your network element deployment. So do you guys, I know I was talking to uh, Uwe before this began. Do any of you guys have upcoming network deployments? A few, yes. Large, small, a larger one coming up. <laughs> so you're going to need automation for this. So yes, we will have to go towards automation in the future going forward. OK, so as we've sort of touched upon, the problem we're facing is that one admin can easily set up one device. But it's an entirely different story. One admin cannot set up 1,000 devices as easily. So I know, sorry, Uwe picking on you again. <laughs> Uwe said he's setting up 156 switches. Switches coming up. Anyone have other devices other than switches, routers, Nexus, routers? OK. So what's, what's your largest deployment? I've, so I've personally only had deployments of about 50 devices. Curious, anyone, anyone beat that? <laughs> yes? 450? So that's, that's a lot. How did you do that deployment? used an Excel spreadsheet and modified the configurations by hand. Who's familiar with that process? I am. I've done that. <laughs> so this is a little bit different, a little bit better, I hope. So what are the requirements which we need for this solution? We need something better than Excel. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone have any requirements? What are, what are we trying to do? Reliable? Yes. That's, that's a good one. That's not one of mine on the list, but absolutely. Has to work? <laughs> yes, also on the list. How about loading code? Upgrading, downgrading? OK. Anything else? Consistent? OK. Do you guys want to load config? <laughs> I would hope, you know, that part needs to be there as well. So what I listed out, I have, we need to be able to pre-provision the devices. So before they come up, we need to be able to do our task. And then we need to upgrade the code with minimal interaction because there's only a few of you, and there's a heck of a lot more switches. Must be Cisco supported, so this plays into the consistency reliable that everyone said. And 
I added it must be cross-platform because we all know that we don't want to deal with one thing on one system, another thing on another system, and another on the other. We just want one thing across all platforms that works. So what we're going to go through today is each of the three OSs, we're going to look at a different method of doing it, which meets those needs. These are not the only methods. These are just the methods which I felt best met our requirements at this time. First, we're going to look at the iOS XR. And we're going to be deploying this with ZTP. I want to pause here for a second and point out there's two different places where we're mentioning ZTP. There's ZTP, the protocol standard compliance. And then there's ZTP agent, which is what's actually running on the iOS XR. So the ZTP agent on the iOS XR is obviously going to be booting up ZTP compliant. So on iOS XR, it first checks to see if there's a username configured. It doesn't matter if there's other things already configured, routes, IP addresses, any of that. It cares about a username. If there's no username, it will try. It then contacts DHCP to get an IP address and a file name attribute, which points it to a shell script in ZTP's case. It will then go to the HTTP server, download that script, and then while that script's running, that script can download, config, and code, upgrade the box, and do any provisioning you need to do on that box. So what you will need to do to prepare for this is on the DHCP server, you, I'm assuming you already have a functioning DHCP server scope. That's not included. <laughs> You'll need to add, it's recommended to add a particular host name and a reserved um, entry for that device. Add the MAC address so that it identifies that particular device. And then the file name attribute, which points to the script. On the HTTP server, you'll have to upload your config, image, and your script, obviously. So this script seems to be the center, right? So that script is where you come in. So for the script, for this particular one, for iOS XR, it's bash. So to start it, you, of course, have to point out bash. You must do that. And you then source this ZTP helper.sh. This contains the functions that actually let you interact with the device, because normally bash doesn't know how to do that. And one word of caution to you guys if you happen to use Windows, you need to have Linux line returns, or the device will not understand them. You'll have the control M's. It does not know how to read those. So inside the ZTP helper, we have different utility functions. So the first one we have is XR command. It simply runs an iOS XR command. I'm sure you guys know that. <laughs> so command to run and the command output, it's fairly simple. You could do show running, capture it into something, and then parse it and use it as normally. The next one we have is XR apply, which takes the new configuration from a file and merges it with the running config. Now, merging, it's not a config replace, but that's probably not an issue since you're dealing with an unconfigured device to begin with. So there's also XR apply with reason. You should, we recommend that you always specify a reason for the logging. So in my examples, I've used 
apply with reason ZTP initial configuration. And you would use this by taking a file, which here we're just making a file that contains a single hostname entry. You could also download that file from a web server or from something else and XR apply the file. If you don't want to use a file or if you're making a small change, you may be better off with XR apply string. And there's, big surprise, also the with reason variant, which we would recommend. So this one works by just specifying the string. And it's a uh, backslash n, which these have, these are in there. So the backslash n to separate the multiple lines of the config or of the configuration. So one of the very nice things I like about iOS XR, it has these config or these command options which you can run these to test your script and you don't need to reboot. Something you'll notice as we discuss the other, op the other OSs, they all need to be rebooted. You have to keep reloading if you keep trying something. On this one, you just do ZTP terminate, ZTP clean, and ZTP initiate. Exactly those three in order. I would do it slightly slowly because it does take some time to do these. But those three will restart the process, and you don't have to reload the box as you're changing your config and trying to get everything working. There's also the no prompt option to remove. These all have a confirm you want to do this, yes, no. No prompt will remove that, so you can just go through them very quick. So the other thing ZTP has is the log locations. As ZTP starts, it logs into this ZTP.log file. So that one is where you would look if you have any issues with your script actually starting. It's not detecting the DHCP options, or it's not able to run the bash script, or the un unknown line returns problem. Those are all in that file. In this other file, the customer script log, is actually the output from your script. So if you have debugs in your script where it prints out this is what's happening, that will show up in that log. So once your script is running reliably, you'll look at that one to debug those. Are there any questions on iOS XR before we continue on? Yes. What was that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was if you can put different parameters in the script so that you can have one script run. At this point, I don't think that's possible. Um, you can, however, have the script detect properties of the device. So one thing you can do is have the script look at the serial number, say, this is my serial number. I'm going to use that serial number to go you know, make a decision. Go to a DHCP server and say, oh, I'm supposed to be hostname this. But it's, it's not actually parameters passed to the device. Does that answer the question? Yes. OK. Any others? OK. So we're making good time. So I will go through Nexus. And XOS will use platform-specific Pope. I don't know, have any of you guys used the Nexus um, Pope before? OK, Nexus has a much larger system that is more of a controller-based system. Trying to go with the single system that goes across platforms, 
the platform specific Pope is actually also ZTP compliant. So if we look, this will be very familiar. We'll go through it quickly. I'll point out the differences. So Nexus looks at the startup config. If there is a startup config at all, it will not continue. Whereas iOS XR looked at the, only the username. Other than that, this should look familiar. Yes? So anyone notice the difference? There's. Yes. This is Python, whereas iOS XR was uh, Bash. So this is the same. We still download the script. We run the script from the device. And it downloads the configuration and the image. Same thing as before, same process. We're trying to make it the same across platforms. So these scripts for Pope, you can actually download the sample scripts from the Cisco website. These scripts are specific to each platform. There's a different script for each platform. What you'll want to look for is the NXOS kickstart. And then you could see down here this Python script. So for the NXOS, obviously, we're going to include Python. And then our utility functions are, unfortunately, slightly different. So we're going to import them all from this CLI library. In these, one, in these, we have CLI is our function which runs a CLI from the command line. And it can save the output into a string for parsing. But we also have CLID, which already returns a JSON format. So are you guys familiar with JSON? A little bit? OK. JSON makes it simpler. So if you've had to parse a command line, it's, it's a mess. You, you're delimited on white space. It's meant for us, not for a script. So you have to go back through and adjust your parsing quite often. The nice thing about JSON is there's actually attributes so the individual items are associated. So you'll have IP address and then the IP address. You don't have to parse it out of anything. One note on this, some of the commands do not support XML. It will throw an exception in that case. Then there's also CLIP, which you can't save the output of. It just automatically prints to the output of the script. So these functions, the CLI functions, if you try to do this, this will not work. These functions are, each of them, they're their own instance. So you have to separate them with a semicolon. And it's very important. It's space, semicolon, space. And then this one will work because you have both commands in the same space. Are there any questions on Nexus? I know that was a very fast overview. OK. So now we're going to look at iOS XE with network plug and play. Has anyone used network plug and play a little bit? A little bit? A few? We got three. So what have you guys used it for? Using plug and play? OK. Has anyone used APIC for anything else? Branches? OK, so that's the iWAN app? OK. OK. So this one functions slightly different. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not quite identical to the other OSs, but this way gets you the best feature set. So iOS XE, similar to Nexus, looks at the startup config. 
and determines whether it's going to continue. That is not correct. <laughs> so iOS XE actually, it does not look at file name. It looks at option 43. And there is a special string for option 43, which I will get updated in these slides if you download later. That string gives the IP address of the APIC-EM server. And the device then communicates with the APIC-EM server back and forth. There's no scripting, none of, the, uh, none of that setup required. Downloads the config image, upgrades itself, and is deployed. So where the automation can come into place is where you interact with the provisioning, because you are going to now have to go through, otherwise, a GUI of APIC-EM and click every time you want to add a device, enter all of the options. And you can't take something like an Excel sheet or a database model and just dump it immediately into APIC-EM. So has anyone used REST APIs? One, four, five? OK. So you all know what the different properties of the REST API are, is. The REST APIs are quick to return. They have to be. It's basically it's built on top of the HTTP model. So the post is, I want to push something up. The get is I want to get something from you. It matches just exactly the HTTP requests. So in that model, though, we'll have the different action. And then the path that we're taking, which this is a URL path. It's the APIC-EM API slash ticket. And then inside that, we will have our different headers, which typically is just JSON. Again, JSON has this nice structured output where you have variables and their values. And then it will have the parameters. In this case, we're looking at user, which has a username and a password we're creating. And then you get a response, also in JSON, from the server. And in this case, the response is a little different, which we'll go into in a second. And those are the general components. So in that response, you see we had service ticket. So this is a little different from probably what we're used to with function calls. Normally with a function call, you get an immediate response, or the function takes time. Because this is REST, you want to have an immediate response. You have to give an immediate response. So if there's a function that takes longer to run, it has to give a service ticket. And that service ticket is what's used to get your actual status. So you would still get a failure if you didn't include the user variable. It can't continue. It knows that. But if you put a space in your username, which it doesn't like, you wouldn't find that out unless you checked the status of the ticket. The immediate call would succeed. Does that make sense? It's a little different. OK. So that service ticket, here's how we get the status. The difference, we're going to get the status. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not the service ticket yet. <laughs> we will get to that. <laughs> so for these REST API calls, we have to authenticate. To authenticate, we again have to get a, similar to the service ticket, we have to get a ticket that is our authentication with the server. And then we pass that ticket in our future calls. So creating the ticket, we, we get 
we get the service ticket from the ticket login, and then we that ticket has an idle timeout and a session timeout. So you can use that ticket for multiple calls. You don't have to keep re-requesting tickets and for every single call. You get one ticket, run through the application, and as long as you don't hit the idle timeout or the session timeout, you're good. The ticket gets passed in the header of the other function calls. So here we're just requesting the session timeout on our ticket and we get back your session timeout is 21600. So that's the basics of how those calls work. For the actual process that you'll need to do to provision the device, first we'll need to create a project. So to create that project, we have to use our user ticket and we're going to request into the PNP project URL, pass in the site name we want to configure, which in this case is Cisco Live, and we get back a response with a task ID, which we're going to have to go check the status of in a second, and the URL, which is just the REST API function to go check the status of that, of that task. So to check that status, we go to that URL, which we got earlier, pass in our auth token, and we get back our actual status. So we did not error the time it took to run, start time, end time, the service type, this is the zero touch deployment service, PNP, and the progress, this is our message from the actual function, which if you notice is just an embedded uh, JSON object inside this one. Next, we're going to have to upload our images. So to do that, we actually use the file image. This is not in the plug and play library itself. It uses the general file upload library. So we're, uh, we upload, and then the file name we need to upload, which in this case I'm just using a CSR image. When we upload that, we get back the name, where it uploaded, the path, the size, some basic things, and this ID. This ID is the important part. We're going to need to use that later. We also need to upload our config using the generic file upload. This is very similar to before, except smaller file size, different ID. So the actual provisioning of the device is only this one function call. So in our project, which we created earlier, we're going to add a device, and then this is all of the information about our CSR. So this is its serial number, platform ID, host name, and then these are the two IDs that we got. If you notice, E80 is our image ID, and our file ID should be 227. And it is. And we get back another task, which we'll have to go check status of as well. But this is only a handful of the functions. Have any of you guys looked at the APIC-EM function library, the APIs, the guys who have used it? What was that? Yes, so as he's saying, in APIC EM, when you log in, there's this button up here which opens the API library, and you can click through each function, and they look very similar to this. I did that intentionally. I made my slides match the web page. The colors, you know, each 
all the posts are green, all the deletes are red, puts are yellow, gets are blue. And you can go through and it explains each of the each of the parameters you need to pass, what structure they need, and the response you'll get, and again, the structure for that. You can also get this online through DevNet. Have you guys done that? Yes? So through DevNet, if you guys have not played with APIC EM, you can go on to DevNet, and there's actually uh, sandbox APIC, which is sandboxapic.cisco.com. Uh, you can log in with way back. This username password is the login for that, and it just that APIC EM is stays up. You can program to it, develop it on it, play with it, become familiar with the platform before you actually deploy it. But it is free to deploy, so you do not have that stopping you. Ooh. Are there any questions on APIC? So the question is, why do you need the product ID? And that was... This one. Um, I do not actually know why you need it. <laughs> I do know it is a, it is, it is a mandatory field. Um, I think it uses that to validate that the image it's going to deploy is correct. No? <laughs> it, yeah. I, I unfortunately I don't have a better answer to that. I can we can exchange information after this, and I can try to get you a better answer on that one. <laughs> Are there any other questions on APIC EM plug and play deployment? Okay, so we looked through we looked through three different solutions on the three different platforms. Again, those were just recommended solutions, the ones that I felt would best meet our requirements of pre-provisioning, upgrading, downgrading, minimal interaction with support, and cross-platform. I will add reliability <laughs> since that came up three times. <laughs> and make sure that we have that. So please, uh, please fill out your surveys. Tell us if you liked the session. Tell us if you didn't. If you didn't, please also tell us why. And please continue your education. There's demos in the. So the question is, do you. So the question is whether you have to configure anything on the device. Is that correct? Okay, so on the device, it finds out about the APIC EM through the, I need to fix this, option 43 variable, which has the IP address of the APIC EM. There's nothing else you have to do on the device. Everything else is on APIC telling it about the device then the device securely negotiates with APIC EM. Does that? Is... 
is there another way other than APIC EM? There is. Um, currently, so you can also you can also deploy this. I'm just going to go back to one of the other ones. Um, you can also use the same ZTP model. The only thing is right now, we only support Tickle Shell for that, which is not exactly what you should be coding in for the future going forward. So that, that is why I elected to go with APIC EM and plug and play instead. Are there any other questions? Yes? So the, the question is, so you're, what you're asking about is that the, I, I'm saying that there's three different methods to provision the three, and you're, you're concerned that that's not one across all of them? Is that, okay. So for the first two, for iOS XR and NXOS, this part was the same except for the, scripting language and the the uh, provisioning check we are working towards getting Python to be supported across all of the platforms so my recommendation going forward is to use Python for that and then yes it could get to the point where there's one method with the same file name option of a Python script to get you there. Does that address your question? Any others? OK. So please, there's there are lots of great resources out here. There is at, I believe it's D3. There is an APIC EM booth where they can talk to you through that. And there is also D4, which I will be at. We're talking through the NetConf, which can go through and configure devices as well from a day one perspective. This is more day zero. And uh, the Puppet booth over in six as well in the DevNet zone. You can also, I'm. Tim Spiglannon, you can meet with me in uh, Meet the Engineer meetings if you have follow-up questions. Okay. Thank you.